Today is early March 20th, 2023, plus seven GMT time. I want to talk about Russia's ongoing military operations in Ukraine, and I want to start, as always, looking at the map. This is from liveuamap.com. It is a pro-Ukrainian map. And uh, let's take a look at the line of contact. And again, the line of contact in the West, uh, everything in red is held by Russia and also considered by Russia, Russian territory. The Dnieper River uh, creates a natural boundary here in Kherson. Uh, Zaporozhye is where many people are speculating that uh, the U upcoming Ukrainian spring offensive is coming in, in this direction. And then again, uh, all along the line of contact in the Donbas region, we see heavy fighting. We see heavy fighting outside of Donetsk city, uh, around Avdivka. And uh, from my last update to this update, and again, remember, this is a pro-Ukrainian map. They are showing the encirclement of Avdivka. And this is very, very significant. This, this area is where Ukrainian forces have been shelling Donetsk city for the last eight to nine years. The civilian population in Donetsk city has been suffering for eight or nine years uh, because of Ukraine's constant shelling in it. And a lot of it is coming from this general area. And uh, Russian forces are now encircling it. They're threatening this main road leading into the city. It's a road and railway. And uh, as they start cutting off these road and railways into the city, this is going to complicate logistics for the forces there. This is a very heavily fortified city. It's been fortified over the course of eight to nine years, uh, as have many cities along the line of contact, including Bakhmut. Now we look at Bakhmut, and uh, this, is, this is where the Western media has been focusing the most. This is where the most intense fighting and most protracted fighting has been taking place. You can see how the city is almost entirely encircled. You can see Russian forces. Again, this is a pro-Ukrainian map. They have taken half of the city uh, on the east side of this uh, waterway. And you can see that they are now pushing into the western half of the city from the south here and they continue developing these uh, pincers to the north and to the south. We also see Russian forces continuously expanding uh, control of territory around Solidar. And because uh, Avdivka, Bakhmut, uh, Solidar, and Seversk, these were the major fortified cities along this uh, defense line, once you break through these fortified cities and break through the line, you complicate the defensive uh, structures of the entire line. Of course, we have to keep an eye on Kremenia and also Kopiansk. Uh, Kopiansk uh, across the Oskol River up here because this is where Ukraine gained territory during the Kharkov Offensive. And now this is where they're giving up territory as Russia incrementally takes it back. And I have explained many times how expensive these Ukrainian offensives were last year in terms of manpower and equipment. They burned through almost an army's worth of men and equipment in these offensives. They lost brigades worth of men. If you don't know what a brigade is, it's about 4,000 men to one brigade, Ukrainian brigade. Uh, they overextended themselves, they burned through their ammunition, their weapons, their trained manpower, and then uh, they left themselves vulnerable to Russian counterattack. And that, that, that is what's happening. Only Russia doesn't commit to these sweeping offensives. They do it in a very incremental, methodical, and very patient way. This minimizes their losses and maximizes Ukrainian losses. And I've talked about how the Western media has been gradually admitting this fact. This is something that I've been talking about for months. Many others following this, uh, trying to be as objective as possible, have been pointing this out. Now the Western media is finally coming around and admitting it also. And this is an article from the New York Times. It is from 
March 16th, so a couple of days ago, and uh, many others have gone over this article. I want to point out a few key points here as well. It's titled, Ukraine burns through ammunition in Bakhmut, putting future fight at risk. The military is using thousands of artillery shells a day as it tries to hold the eastern city, which could jeopardize a planned springtime campaign. And I've covered similar articles. As you can see, this is a reoccurring theme now across the Western media. Uh, it says the Ukrainian military is firing thousands of artillery shells a day as it tries to hold the eastern city of Bakhmut, a pace that American and European officials say is unsustainable and could jeopardize a planned springtime campaign that they hope will prove decisive. The bombardment has been so intense that the Pentagon raised concerns with Kiev recently after several days of nonstop artillery firing. Two U.S. officials said, highlighting the tension between Ukraine's decision to defend Bakhmut at all costs and its hopes for retaking territory in the spring. One of those officials said the Americans warned Ukraine against wasting ammunition at a key time. And that this is probably the most important part of this article. Uh, it says, with so much riding on a Ukrainian counteroffensive, the United States and Britain are preparing to ship thousands of NATO and Soviet-type artillery rounds and rockets to help shore up supplies for a coming Ukrainian offensive. But a senior American defense official described that as a last-ditch effort because Ukraine's allies do not have enough ammunition to keep up with Ukraine's pace and their stocks are critically low. Western manufacturers are ramping up production, but it will take many months for new supplies to begin meeting demand. Actually, it will take many years. Uh, two to three years from now, the United States hopes to be manufacturing 90,000 artillery shells per month, but this, this doesn't even come close to matching, let alone exceeding what Russian forces are currently firing on the battlefield. Russia is also ramping up production in, in all areas of its military industrial output. Now, why is this important? I, I have been covering for many months now the amounts of uh, artillery pieces and ammunition being sent to Ukraine. And uh, we've all seen together that the amounts have been dwindling. We see admissions that they are running out of ammunition that they can spare Ukraine. That doesn't mean that there is no more ammunition at all. As a matter of fact, the United States and Europe have been maintaining a, a stockpile for themselves, for training and for other contingencies, other wars they may uh, end up fighting in the middle of this proxy war. They have that stockpile on hand. And it seems that they are suggesting that they are now utilizing that stockpile. So they are probably now sending more artillery rounds to Ukraine than they have in a very long time. Ukraine will get this major influx of ammunition. But as the New York Times points out, this is a one-time occurrence. They can send uh, ammunition from this stockpile one time, and once it's gone, it's gone. They will have to go back uh, to depending on what they are able to manufacture month to month, which right now isn't much. And as, as I just pointed out, in two or three years, it still won't be that much. So surely Russia is aware of this. Surely they have uh, the means of ascertaining how much ammunition more or less is flowing into Ukraine. They understand that Ukraine is being prepared for a, a springtime offensive, just as they prepared for their Kharkov and Kherson offenses. I don't think that Russia is underestimating Ukraine. We saw the extensive defense uh, works that they were creating in, in Zaporozhye, as we saw on the map, and in the Donbas region. They are, they are preparing for this, and they have mobilized 350,000 reservists as well, who uh, have not been fully committed to the fighting right now that we see this so-called winter offensive that the, the Western media has assigned to Russia. We have not seen that massive reserve force committed yet because I believe their, their primary function is going to be to uh, defend against this offensive and then uh, exploit uh, Ukraine's diminished fighting capacity in the aftermath. Uh, the New York Times goes on and it says, 
This has put Kiev in an increasingly perilous position. Its troops are likely to have one meaningful opportunity this year to go on the offensive, push back Russian forces, and retake land that was occupied after the invasion began last year. But, but to what end? Because they're not going to take back everything. And even if they were somehow able to do that, as we've seen in the aftermath of the Kherson and Kharkov offensives, they are a spent force and, and they will have to wait for NATO to deliver again another army's worth of equipment and to train up another army's worth of trained manpower. Uh, that will be the window of opportunity Russia has to push back and uh, continue whittling away at Ukraine's uh, military, its military and its infrastructure. And this is what Russia has been doing all along. This is what has created this crisis for Ukraine and its Western sponsors in the first place. And they're going to continue doing this. And so to what end? See, even if they take large amounts of territory back, uh, Russia still has no reason at all to, to settle it. At that point, they will continue fighting on until they get uh, whatever it is that they want to get. As Russian forces have done in the past when facing a uh, a major Ukrainian offensive, they, if they feel that they will suffer huge losses or they risk being encircled, they'll simply withdraw. Uh, because this is not about territory. This is about the ratio of how much uh, men and equipment they destroy versus how much they themselves lose. And uh, as long as they maintain that ratio in a, in a favorable way for Russia, then that is them winning because Ukraine and its sponsors have a finite amount of men and materiel that they can spend on this proxy war, and it's much less than what Russia has. The New York Times, uh, speaking of trained manpower, the, the amount that Ukraine has available, the New York Times admits that Ukrainian casualties have been so severe that commanders will have to decide whether to send units to defend Bakhmut or use them in a spring offensive uh, several of the officials said, and this goes back to uh, previous articles admitting that most of the, the, the troops, the Ukrainian troops trained by NATO over the last eight to nine years, they are mostly gone. They, they, are, they are gone. And what you have left are troops that are being hastily trained. They're not getting nearly enough training to be effective on the battlefields, uh, just in the most basic capacity, let alone uh, effective in maneuver warfare or combined arms warfare. We have been hearing rumors that there's going to be some sort of counteroffensive, Ukrainian counteroffensive at Bakhmut. Uh, in order for that to have any chance at all of succeeding, they're going to have to divert trained manpower and equipment away from their preparations for the upcoming offensive to this counteroffensive. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about uh, Russia's current operations, the pressure they're placing all along the line of contact is spoiling their preparations for the upcoming spring offensive. They're going to divert manpower and equipment for this counteroffensive in Bakhmut that was supposed to be reserved for this upcoming offensive elsewhere. The article also claims, and very similar to the other articles that I've been going over in the last uh, week or so. More than 200,000 Russians are estimated to have been wounded or killed since the start of the war. The Ukrainian figure is more than 100,000. Russia can conscript forces from its population, which is around three times the size of Ukraine's, but both sides are contending with ammunition shortages. Russia's formations are firing more ammunition than Ukraine's. So Russia has more, tr has more troops now on the battlefield. They have more weapons weapons, they have more ammunition, and yet somehow we're supposed to believe that Ukraine is inflicting t twice as many casualties on Russia than they themselves are suffering. And I've already gone over this many, many times. Uh, even the Kiev Independent, a pro-Ukrainian media platform, uh, this is this month, March 4th, 2023, public data suggests over 16,000 Russian soldiers have been killed during uh, first year of all-out war. And so that's not even close to 200,000. That is much, much less than what Ukraine itself and, and its sponsors, its Western sponsors are admitting that Ukraine has lost. So the 
again, goes back to that ratio because this is a war of attrition. This is not a war of territorial conquest. This is demilitarization. This is what Russia announced at the very beginning of the special military operation. This was their primary objective, and this is what they are doing right now. I want to point out another article. This is also from the Kiev Independent. And, uh, Alexander Mercurius of the Duran did an excellent video breaking down this article. I want to go over it and certain points as well. The link to Alexander's video will be in the video description below, so please check it out. Uh, it's this article here. Battle of Bakhmut. Ukrainian soldiers worry Russians begin to taste victory. Now, why am I going over this article? I'm going over this article because we just saw uh, the New York Times claim that there's 200,000 Russian casualties versus 100,000 Ukrainian casualties. Let me read to you from this pro-Ukrainian article from a pro-Ukrainian newspaper, and you tell me if it sounds like a situation where Ukraine is inflicting more casualties on Russia than it's suffering itself. You tell me if that uh, is a reasonable conclusion to draw. A Ukrainian infantryman says that most of his fallen comrades were fatally wounded by projectile fragments. It's a pity that probably 90% of our losses are from artillery or tanks and aviation. And uh, artillery, tanks, aviation, these are all things that Russia has in abundance and that Ukraine is facing critical shortages of. Uh, he told the Kiev Independent a few hours after leaving the Bakhmut front and much less casualties from shooting ba ba uh, battles. He counted that only a few of the original 27 members of his platoon got out of Bakhmut front with uh, the Bakhmut front with him, though he explained that most of them were wounded, not killed. The Russians have so many weapons and there are so many of them. He said, they are firing at us all the time. Sometimes you hear an incoming shell every second. And if you're following me on Telegram or Twitter, and the links to, to both platforms are in the video description below, I actually uh, shared a video from Bakhmut where you, you can just uh, look at your watch and you can count the shells coming in every, every second. That is not hyperbole. That is literally happening in Bakhmut. That is what that is the fire that Ukrainians are under uh, every single day now, day and night. The article goes on and it says, infantryman Vladislav said that the Russians would usually appear in a group of about five people at night, but they seemed scared to launch close range attacks because they're not, they're not attacking, they're drawing Ukrainian fire. So instead, the Russians would use mass firepower to destroy the houses where the Ukrainians hid to monitor invading forces to the point that they were forced to abandon the position to seek another position with better protection, according to Vladislav. They are now fighting smartly too. And he's referring to the uh, Russian, the Russian forces. Relying heavily on drones, the Russians would locate Ukraine's positions in, in the area. They would then fire multiple rounds of mortar and artillery, which would then be followed by infantry assaults in an attempt to encircle Ukrainian soldiers. We're, we're looking at the map and we see that this is, this is a successful strategy. If the drones cannot detect Ukrainian positions, the Russians will send a few soldiers to fire gunshots until they hear return fire, which is what they were talking about with those groups of five at night, that they are drawing out fire. So heavy weapons, uh, indirect fire can target them. What are they describing? Again, in a pro-Ukrainian publication, they're describing that Russia doesn't just outgun them. They don't just have more ammunition than them. They are also playing out fighting them. They are out fighting them in, in terms of logistics and also tactics and, and also strategy. And this is a far cry from these human wave attacks that the Western media had been talking about in previous weeks. And again, it's not as if Russian forces aren't suffering losses. They are, they're suffering losses every single day in Bakhmut, but they're just suffering them uh, at such a lower rate than Ukraine. Uh, and this is part of the strategy. It is a war of attrition. When you see these videos of Ukraine hitting a Russian position, uh, and wiping out a group of Wagner uh, uh, troops. 
uh, of course that is happening, but how often is that happening versus how often it's happening to Ukrainian positions and Ukrainian troops? This deluge of articles, pe very pessimistic, grim articles coming out of the Western media, including pro-Ukrainian, Ukrainian-based publications like the Kiev Independent, uh, they are coming out and they are describing what is happening. And we can see Russia's uh, war of attrition playing out and playing out in Russia's favor. And so this is how Ukraine is going to be going into the spring offensive. Uh, we keep hearing that the, the troops and the equipment being prepared for that offensive, that is being prepared separately. But we're also being told that most of the troops that NATO trained over the last eight to nine years, properly trained over the last eight to nine years, they're all gone. And what you get are these uh, troops being given abbreviated training courses uh, to operate vehicles that Ukraine has no experience operating. And this is a process that takes months to a year or more, and it's being condensed over the course of a few weeks. And this, this simply is not adequate. And it's going to show on the battlefield come the time Ukraine decides to launch this offensive. People have to remember that just producing a basic infantryman takes half a year or more just to produce a, a basic infantryman who can operate in a squad, a fire team, maybe four or five men. Uh, and then they have to learn how to operate in larger groups like platoons or a company, which is about a hundred men or a battalion, about a, uh, a thousand or a brigade in Ukraine's case, 4,000 men. And it's not just 4,000 infantrymen all fighting in, in a coordinated manner. They all have different weapon systems. They have to train in combined arms warfare. And this takes a very long time to train, to do effectively, and Ukraine simply doesn't have the time. Uh, these troops going to the UK, for example, these are brand new recruits. They have no military experience and they are, begin, they are being given crash courses just over the course of a few weeks. Entirely inadequate. They're going to launch this offensive with uh, troops that are not prepared with equipment they are unfamiliar with uh, against Russian positions that have been prepared months ahead of time. Uh, and then they are going to suffer whether the offensive goes relatively well or if it goes disastrously wrong either way they're going to lose the, the majority of their troops and equipment uh, only this time unlike Kherson and Kharkov there is no more equipment there is no more ammunition the West has to send in these large quantities you could already see them struggling to scrape together these tanks uh, so this is a complete disaster this is the, uh, admittedly, this is their last opportunity. This is what even the Western media and Western governments are saying. And when they're talking like that, it really seems like it's just a roll of the dice. They already know that it's more or less doomed, but they're going to try anyway because they can't really think of anything else to try, uh, except for obviously negotiating. This was never about resolving a conflict. This was about using a conflict to advance US foreign policy objectives at the expense of the Ukrainian people. And as long as the US is paying for this proxy war in the blood of Ukrainians, the, the money of uh, taxpayers on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, when it's unless it's them actually paying the price themselves, they have no no motivation to stop this proxy war until it's just physically impossible for them to, to fight on any longer because Ukraine's military has been entirely exhausted and destroyed. Really, the only way uh, the outcome of this conflict can change is if NATO intervenes more directly, uh, either creating some sort of buffer zone in Western Ukraine or uh, going in and fighting Russian forces directly. Uh, but even that is not a guarantee that the outcome of the conflict will change. And uh, of course, that raises the risk for some sort of miscalculation and escalation and even nuclear war. Uh, so this is where we are right now. We are at the end of the road for this proxy war and 
dangerous decisions are to be made in the halls of Washington, London, and Brussels. And judging by uh, their decision-making up until this point, we should probably all be very worried about